All right, so um, my disclosures. This is really um, 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 a number of years' work with a multidisciplinary team at UPenn and, and, <clears throat> and Novartis. So I'm going to talk about some of the general findings that we made in treating CAR T uh, patient with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia with CAR T cells. And, um, and, and then tattoo how that augmented CAR T cell function. The disease that, we're, that I'm talking about today is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and this is a, one of the more uh, predominant uh, uh, malignancies, uh, leukemias in, in, um, in mostly elderly patients. It has a male preponderance, and um, patients are treated uh, nowadays with novel small molecules that are targeting key signaling pathways in these cells, such as uh, uh, BTK um, uh, the kinase. But these small molecules, even though they um, induce a deeper mission, none of them are curative, and, and these therapies also come at significant biological and financial uh, toxicity. Um, Cell-based therapies have shown great potency in CLL, such as allogeneic transplant, because of the advanced age of these patients, uh, most patients actually aren't eligible for uh, G, uh, allo allo G, uh, stem cell transportation. And also, uh, stem cell transportation comes at uh, um, a cost of graft versus host disease. Um, in 2010, uh, after uh, a few years' work by Mike Malone and Carmine Carpenito in Carl June's lab, we started treating patients with CLL with uh, CD19 targeting CARs. And um, over the past few years, we've seen in two separate trials that 26% uh, of these patients uh, um, attain a stable, durable remission uh, without relapse. But um, so this still posed the, the question, why do we see such a low response rate in CLL when acute lymphoblastic leukemia is known to have 80 or 90% complete response rate after one or three months of uh, um, evaluations? So we started this study in CLL, and CLL is long known to be a disease uh, when, where there's T cell dysfunction and also immune suppression by the CLL cells. And a number of mechanisms have been described over the past few years. John Gribben has been one of the main contributors. And what's known so far is that T cells form an unstable interaction with, CLL, uh, with T cells. Um, and um, the CLL cells are hypo-responsive to adopted uh, T cell therapy. A number of other uh, uh, dysfunctions have been noted in, in T, uh, T cells, such as low cytokine production, the hypoproliferative, um, and so forth. Some more recent findings from collaboration with Arlon Kader in Amsterdam, Netherlands, is that we characterized the metabolism in T cells and found that CLOT1 levels, uh, total levels were lower in T cells for these patients, and mitochondrial uh, dysfunction is also noted. Um, what we noticed also in these patients, and other have others have confirmed this, that these cells express uh, high levels of the IL-2 receptor, and one could hypothesize that that contributes also to the immune dysfunction. I'm not going to talk about the interaction between the T cells and, and CLL cells. Uh, Mackenzie Collins, a graduate student in my lab, will talk about it today at 12 noon. So I please invite you all to come and listen to her talk with some surprise findings, I must add. Um, but I'll be talking mostly about what we found on, the, on these trials, the translational studies. Our manufacturing process, in essence, is real simple. We start with an apheresis, we purify T cells, transduce them with a lentiviral vector, encoding the murine CD19 targeting car, carrying 4-1-BB CD3 zeta signaling domains on days 0 and 1 with bead activated cells. Um, and then by day 4 or 5, we transfer the cells to a wave bioreactor where the cells are expanded for 4 or 5 more days, standard operating procedures. Beads are removed, cells are quite preserved, quality control tests are run, and all passes the release criteria patients are then infused on a split dosing schema, meaning that patients are infused with a 10% dose on day one, 30% day uh, two, and then 60% if no toxicities occurred on the, on the last, uh, the third day. So this has uh, the first trial that we reported um, in 14 patients was in 2015 in science translational medicine. What they reported, the PI on this study, and the next I'm going to discuss, what we noted that there's a really important biomark in CLL that predicts where the patients or correlates where the patients will respond or not to this therapy. And that was found by analyzing the 
uh, the expansion and persistence of CAR T cells. So this is a PCR-based assay where we amplify the transgene, the 4MBB uh, CD3Z uh, um, chimeric molecule, and we know that, that if you look at the, uh, um, the top row, which are complete responding patients, that all of them have a dramatic expansion and persistence of these CAR T cells, whereas the bottom rows, we really don't see that. Um, so the first patients, first three patients responded really well, and then we had a string of patients that did, actually did not respond so well to the therapy, and then some occasional partial responders. Some of these patients had a transformed disease, uh, but others did not. So we had the challenge of finding out why we had this differential response rates, and that's really where my journey started. So we reported initially the 14 patients. Last year, Nature Medicine reported 41 patients in total on these two trials. And again, confirming that the expansion and persistence of CAR T cells are key attributes of, of the success of this therapy. Furthermore, the persistence um, on, on the top graphs is shown in the first one year. Patients one and two who were infused in 2010 actually show a persistence of seven or eight years and detectable by PCR, as shown here in the red uh, um, um, triangles or by flow cytometry with an anti-CAR specific antibody uh, in, in the blue circles. Both patients are still in deep remission, have no B cells, and their, this toxicity is managed by IVIG. So what does persistence look like by flow cytometry? Well, it's quite dramatic. You can see that here in this patient number one, um, that at eight years, you can see that, uh, so this is our flow-based assay where we measure CD8 on the x-axis. And, and the car in the y-axis, the left-hand graph has fluorescence minus one control, we leave the antibody out. The right-hand graph, we show that the car staining is still there and mostly in CD8 negative cells. So these are some really important general observations in patients that we treat with, with this car therapy. Uh, so more general observations have been made in infusion product characterization in this group. Uh, we analyzed the infusion product, but also post uh, the pre-manufacturing cells and uncovering some uh, pathways that were differentially expressed between these two, um, mostly these two patient groups in that responding and PRTD patients, transformed disease patients, had an enrichment of pathways that indicated early memory T cell function, but also non-exhaustion and STAT3 signaling. Whereas non-responding patients had an enrichment in apoptosis, exhaustion, glycolysis, hypoxia pathways. And, and most of these pathways, we, uh, we published this, we, we followed up and, and, and confirmed that they were uh, phenotypically identifiable or even biologically um, uh, validated, uh, such as the glycolysis. Uh, and, and then the, the bigger challenge was really to see if we could identify a feature in pre-manufacturing CAR T cells. So we took a small aliquot of the A3 cells and did our analysis, uh, and, uh, examining the hypothesis that memory features were um, the, the key drivers of, of CAR T cell potency. We used a panel that was developed by Enrico Lockley and Luca Gattinoni. Um, and surprisingly and disappointingly, I must add, we found that there was not really a strong correlation between any of the known memory T cell subsets. So rather than sticking with the known subsets, we uh, used these markers as biomarkers combining one versus the next and found that the proportion of CD27 positive, CD45 RO negative, EIE, either naive or early memory cells, was significantly enriched in pre-manufacturing T cells on these patients. We did the additional characterizations looking at cell cycle status, as shown in this middle graph by KI67 and CD8 staining. The top uh, figure shows the, um, the population that we identified. The bottom is the, um, the central memory population. This really shows that our population is not cycling, and the right end graph shows that these cells are expressing granzyme B, so they're not naive cells. They're not central memory cells. They're somewhere in between. So that's a general picture that we found in CLL. So the immunobiology seems to fit very well with what we know about T cells in that expansion and persistence. So the memory function of T cells are really what drives the efficacy of the therapy. So it's, uh, features such as proliferation, uh, um, 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 cell renewal, uh, as shown here, cytokine polyfunctionality, those are, those are enriched in these early memory T cells. Inflammatory cytokine production cytolysis are enriched in, in effector memory and effector cells, which aren't able to sustain the, uh, uh, the res response. So that's important learnings that we made on 41 patients, but what about other learnings? So we measure, as I said, the CAR expansion by PCR with a specific PCR assay, 
And we came across a very unusual case that was infused with 10 and 30 percent dose of CAR T cells in June of 2012 did not respond, we still had the 60% um, dose in the freezer, we infused the patient with, with those murine CAR T cells, and, um, and then um, the first one, one and a half months, we saw nothing happening, but all of a sudden the patient developed high-grade cytokine release syndrome, we started noting that the B cells were disappearing from the circulation, and also the bulky lymph node disease was, um, uh, it took a little bit more time, but it was uh, resolved in this patient too. So we had an unusual case, and we wanted to study more <clears throat> what was happening in this particular patient. So we do that by sequencing first the infusion product, as shown here on this graph. On the left-hand side, you can see the CDA-positive um, uh, CAR T cells on, on the left-hand side. <clears throat> next to it, the CDA-positive CAR T cells. And you can see that the slice, the so V-beta sequencing, each of these pies is made up of multiple different clonotypes. The, the, this slide really tells you that the repertoire in the infusion product was polyclonal. <clears throat> when we analyzed perf blood mononuclear cells one month after the second infusion, so this was before cytokine release syndrome, again we see a very polyclonal repertoire. But then analyzing one month later, or actually 50 days after the first infusion, now we see that everything has changed. Now we see that, that CD8 repertoire is made up of a single V-beta and actually a single clone. Because we had an antibody available from commercial sources, we can now stain the V-beta and, um, and compare it with car staining and had a V-beta 13.1 uh, as control antibody on the right-hand side. Um, joy. Um, so you can see that the car stains. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, so this V-beta antibody co-stains the car in this population, confirmed the clonal origins, and V-beta 13.1 did not stain. But what's really important is that when we analyze the infusion product for the present of this clone, in the bottom part of this slide, you can see the red, red dot, which it signifies the clonal expansion, was not identifiable in the infusion product. So that means that it's low abundance. It's there, but it's low abundance because we analyze a billion, um, so 0.2, million cells. Whole blood at one month after the second infusion, also we did not identify the clone, but then at the peak of expansion, we see that this clone is identifiable. Furthermore, we developed a clone-specific PCR, and, and uh, that's shown on the right and bottom slide in, in, in red. Now we could track the clone, and now we could see that the expansion was quite dramatic. We calculated from data from peripheral blood, this clone had undergone 29 population doublings, but of course it's a gross underestimate because we didn't look at the marrow, we did not look at the, uh, at the lymph nodes. So to, uh, for, for sure, the expansion was quite dramatic. Because it's a clonal expansion, of course, we wanted to know more about the lentiviral vector integration site itself. And FDA was also very interested in, in this, this study. So we collaborated with Rick Bushman, with whom we have collaborated on a number of projects. Um, he has a pipeline set up that works really well, where he uh, um, sequences the integration size, but also the same pipeline allowed us to assess the clonality of the repertoire. And the way he does it is by taking the genomic DNA of these time points or the infusion product or whatnot, he shares it by sonication, which generates random breaks ligates adapters and then use a PCR with one primer sitting in the car and the second in the adapter amplifies the uh, integration sites and in sequences and that shows you here in orange you see that there's a clonal expansion but because of the random break the round, so the, uh, the adapter annealings are also in different sites we can now assess what the clonality is of, of these populations. Using this assay, uh, we found that, uh, again, looking at the infusion product, and that's a typical finding, that the infusion product itself is made up of a large number uh, of, of uh, low frequency uh, clonotypes. So that's why the bar on the left hand side that says infusion product is all gray. Um, about uh, uh, two weeks or a month into the infusion, that's again a general observation, we see that there's clonal attrition, we see few expanding, but then in this patient, 50 days after the uh, infusion, the second infusion, we see that there's, there's a single clonal expansion confirmed with the TCR sequence data, but now also we know what the integration site is, and that's uh, shown here, it's a <clears throat> tattoo, it's, it's the integration site in this CD8 positive CAR T cell population. Doing the Shannon index, the clonality, the clonality analysis, we see that at the time of expansion, this, this curve rapidly drops and then uh, normalizes after the tumor is, uh, is eradicated from, from the various compartments. 
<clears throat> furthermore, an, an interesting observation in this patient is that the, uh, the expansion of these CAR T cells, the, the phenotype, the cells at the height of expansion, meaning the highest numbers in HLA-DR expression activation status, <clears throat> we noted that this uh, population had a central memory phenotype, whereas in normally in patients, like in patients one and two, we see effective memory cells dominating the repertoire. So the tattoo integration, we hypothesized, had affected the biology of these, these CAR T cells. So TAT2 is an epigenetic regulator. It's a dioxygenase that, that uses <coughs> iron and, and deoxyglutarate to convert metal cytosine into hydroxycytosines and contributes essentially to demethylation of methylated cytosines. <coughs> Mutations in TAT2 frequently occur in heme malignancies um, uh, such as myeloid malignancies and T-cell lymphomas, but these mutations never occur by themselves. Um, and tattoo mutation by itself is not enough to uh, transform uh, um, uh, the T cells. Um, <clears throat> so we knew about the integrated site itself, which happened on one of the alleles. We still wanted to know if the other allele was intact or carried a mutation, and therefore we um, sequenced a number of candidate genes in heme malignancies, and now we found, actually, that the second allele wasn't intact. We had a mutation in the catalytic domain encoded by axon 11. So that conferred a hypofunctionality, as we hypothesized. So now we collaborated with Raul Coley at UPenn to analyze the bio, uh, biochemical activity of this second allele. So we did that by transfecting 293 cells, either wild type or mutant tattoo allele, and then analyzing these various um, oxidation species of, of metal cytosine. And now we could see, uh, we did this by, by uh, mass spec, but also by dot plot analysis, <clears throat> that this allele actually has a fairly normal hydroxymethylation activity, but the subsequent oxidation steps are, are severely uh, uh, inhibited, if you will. So now we have a hypomorphic tattoo status in this T cell population of, of the patient. So those are very interesting observational studies, but now we needed to link these observations with mechanism. So we started using um, a short hairpin RNAs to knock down tattoo in normal donor T cells. <coughs> Excuse me. And we did this analysis in 20 uh, plus uh, normal donors to make sure that the observations were all real. The way that it worked is that we transduced uh, these T cells with the um, SH RNA that we identified that gave a 50% knockdown with the SH RNA and the CAR and purified these CAR T cells after the 10 to 14 days manufacturing process and then used our stress test where we essentially uh, um, stimulated these populations for three consecutive rounds with CD19 expressing leukemia cells, analyzing the cell numbers, the phenotype of the cells after each stimulation, the cytokine expression profile, um, and, and, and whatnot. So here, um, what we found first is that when we downregulate tattoo in normal donor T cells, again, the process is shown on the top left side, this, this tattoo downmodulation confirms a, a, an enhanced proliferative ability of these cells matching what we've seen in the patients in vivo. So that's the first confirmation that tattoo contributed to the biology of these cells. Second, we analyzed the phenotype of these cells during the culture. And now we noted, again, that tattoo downmodulation enriches for central memory cells, conversely depletes the effector cells from the cultures, again enhances the memory function of CAR T cells. And then third, we analyzed cytokine secretion profile at each stimulation, collecting supernatants at 24 hours, using Luminex at 25 cytokine multiplex assay, analyzing the repertoire and control SH RNA, scrambled SH RNA versus TAT2. And here you can see that after the third stimulation, our TAT2 downmodulated cell still has a polyfunctional feature generating high levels of multiple uh, cytokines, whereas the control did not. So again, the tattoo DAR modulation enhanced the memory function of these CAR T cells. Furthermore, importantly, we noted that the effective function was somewhat inhibited in that uh, interferon gamma levels were lower in tattoo DAR modulated cells, whereas in IL-2, an important growth cytokine, was still uh, maintained at high levels by these cells. Um, and, and this uh, was published in Nature, and our colleague, former colleague, Marcel Amaus, wrote a really nice uh, uh, news and views piece about our findings. I would encourage you to read this as well. It's a nice summary. But again, this confirms what we have seen in the large group of patients, that even by uh, modulating a single pathway, 
the feature that's important for the biology, the efficacy of the therapy was enhanced and that polyfunctionality was maintained. The factor function was somewhat uh, reduced because of central memory enrichment and cell renewal is also enhanced by tattoo down modulation. So now we have a synthetic enhancement of CAR T cells with so convergence of intrinsic biological qualities with uh, um, uh, um, the, the epigenetic modulation of these cells of a single clone, I must add. All right, so that's an important finding. So the CLL patient, um, to summarize, was infused with CAR T cells, uh, the first 10 to 30 percent, and then two months later with the 60 percent dose, had a delayed expansion of CAR T cells, which turned out, turned out to be clonal, which turned out to carry uh, the CAR integration into one of the tattoo alleles, and by sequencing the second intact allele, we found that that allele had a uh, hypomorphic uh, mutation that rendered the cells um, um, dysfunctional, uh, the, sorry, the tattoo alleles. So this uh, then indicates that tattoo modulation enhances the efficacy of CAR T cell therapies. That's something that we're following up on. All right, so where does it lead us next? So now we know that basic biology, the, 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 um, the, the baseline features are important to drive the therapy. We also know that the integration side itself has an con important contributing role to the efficacy we see that these patients have a dramatic persistence of CAR T cells, and so now we want to know more about what the lent viral vector integration site does to the biology of these cells. Patients one and two were infused um, over uh, eight years, almost nine years ago with CAR T cells, so we have still have some important learnings to do. And, and I presented this data a few days ago, uh, essentially what we do, because we can identify these cells by uh, flow cytometry, meaning we can also use mass spec-based uh, analyses like CYTOF. We stained these cells with a panel of 40 markers um, at, at multiple time points after infusion, identifying stable clusters using UMAP and phenograph. And, and now we identified in these two patients that there were four and five uh, clusters in CD8 and CD4 CAR T cells. The phenotype of CAR T cells at late time points is different with some of these um, clusters, like two enriched in CAR positive cells, and other clusters equally distributed across CAR positive and CAR negative cells. So the CAR does do something to the T cells, and possibly the antigen stimulation, because normal B cell uh, neogenesis still happens. <clears throat> we followed these clusters in both patients uh, at multiple time points, and now we see that in CD4 CAR T cells. Remember, CD4 T cells are the ones that are persisting long term with a lower abundance of CD8 CAR T cells. We see initially that the, 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 the contribution of various clusters is different, but then cluster number two is enriched in, in both patient late time points. And interestingly, uh, this, this cluster contained uh, high-level expression HLA-DR, CD38 so activation markers, KI67, the cells are actively cycling, but also PD1 digit, uh, CTLA4, and other markers. So now we have a population that's actively engaged with target cell antigens, but also being negatively regulated by the <clears throat> molecules that we try to target in cancer. And actually, I would argue that, that in, in this case, we have persisted because of the function of the negative regulation, the breaks on the immune system, if you will. So analyzing, again, the lenduvario vector and gray site repertoire, these two patients, we have a manuscript submitted where we analyze 40 patients in total with a shorter follow-up time. These patients, we have up to eight years. We see that the infusion products themselves are very polyclonal, no clonal dominance, but that rapidly changes after infusion, day 28. Importantly also, we see that there's a, a selection of certain integration sites as shown here. Patient one, we have eight dominant clonal types that have at any time point 10% or more of the repertoire is made up of those clones. And what also importantly is that these clones are stable across over time. And these integration sites are different in both patients. Stability was then analyzed using Morosita overlap index analysis, and here we see that um, if, there, if there's a large dark blue dot, that means there's a large overlap between uh, the, in the repertoire. There's nobody's cell phone, right? Um, <laughs> there, there's a large overlap in the integration sites at, at late time points. I mean that the in, uh, clones that we identify are repeatedly identified and characterized or identified in these patients. So putting this all together, we see that the biology of the CAR T cell therapies is quite interesting and possibly informs us about basic principles, but also what the integration site itself does to the biology of cells and the efficacy. Again, I'd like to encourage you to attend uh, uh, Mackenzie's uh, talk at 12 noon when she talks about what happens when you put a CAR T cell with CL. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's a large team that actually contributed to this analysis. Um, 
And uh, not everybody was listed, the slide wasn't big enough, uh, but uh, there's a large team on the Penn side, Novartis, uh, collaboration across campus, um, and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that and take questions if you have. Thank you. This abstract is now open for questions. We have microphones in the center in the back. Um, as you knock down TET2, does mitochondrial biogenesis or respiration go up? And then second question, the CD27, 45, you know, the naive-like uh, memory, is that just in general a good prognostic kind of indication? Um, great question. So we are following up on those questions. So we have learned about mitochondrial function in CAR T cells in, in context of CLL. We are still analyzing the question that you asked. Definitely very important. Um, the second question, we are, uh, we, we, we are in the process of wrapping up search and analysis in adult ALL, uh, multiple myeloma with a BCMA targeting CAR, and on Hodgkin's lymphoma with another CAR, uh, and analyzing the uh, pre-manufacturing T cells. And we have a very interesting uh, signature that we identified. Also, we have the infusion products that we analyzed. I'm going to submit this for ASH uh, to see if, if uh, you know, I can share that data back then. Presentation. Uh, so, uh, did you have a chance to evaluate the TET2 uh, status in other long-term uh, complete responders? Is it a unique event or is it something that you actually were able to see in other patients? Great question. Uh, we have an R01 to do exactly that. Uh, these two patients were analyzed now because we have these very long persistence, but definitely we'll be doing a lot more of that to understand the biology in, in CLL, but also other indications. Yes. It may impact actually the process for the further Sorry? It may impact the process development. Actually. Sure it does. Sure it does. Absolutely agree. Yeah. I have a very quick question unless someone... Oh, Sydney, please. Okay. I was going to fill in. Please go. Now, in terms of the, um, phenot you know, the deep phenotyping, how about... I don't... Were there patients who did not respond or only had a partial or not a great response who did have long-term persistence of CAR? And mm -hmm. if so, what was the phenotype different? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, so in, in this patient, I didn't highlight that here, but uh, when we look at the flow, uh, flow, of cytomatic, flow of cytomatic analysis in non-responding patients, we don't find CAR T cells. So we don't know what it looks like. There weren't, there weren't patients that had good persistence. No? No, no, and then we, right, so we do have some partially responding patients. We have two groups, one with, that transformed with lymphoma. They are just like the CR patients because that's out, outside of their control, but the PR patient will definitely will be looking at that. What's interesting in, in analyzing these 40 patients, that the integration size that we find are all different. Um, but maybe the pathways, when we look at long term, will tell us a little bit more about you know, what contributes to. Yep. So you showed the first patient uh, persistent CAR T cells as CD4. Then later yeah. on you showed the pre-manufactured T cells, uh, naive CD8 positive yeah. cells respond yeah. to better yeah. response. How do yeah. you? What's up with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, so it's, it's a CD4 T cells that are dominating, but that there's still CD8 CAR T cells present, and we phenotype them. But we emphasize CD4 because they're making up a large proportion. I think what's happening with these uh, BBC that engineered uh, CAR T cells, that initially we find that CD8 cells are the ones that are expanding most dramatically uh, and, and, and then contract when the tumor disappears. So they're playing a really important part in the initial phase of the immune response. I think the second part, the maintenance of remission, is, is uh, probably mostly by CD4 CAR T cells. Um, we are revisiting those phenotypes in, in pre-manufacturing T cells and uncovering a phenotype that we, using new novel pipelines, analytical pipelines like uh, Surat and Phenograb, that uh, tells us some more about CD4 T cells too. But it's a great question, definitely. Make it quick. We're running behind. <laughs> Please. Uh, very short. Did you look at uh, CD4, CD8 double negative cells? <laughs> uh, we did some of that, yes. Uh, did not look at NKT cells, CD1D, restricted. Um, great question. We did find that N double negative T cells did expand. Um, we started looking at gamma delta cells, but like I said, not uh, uh, NKT cells. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk today. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.